All right, we are good to go. So thank you everybody for joining us tonight. This is a webinar on the DISCOVER trial for vets, and we have ACER Therapeutics with us to talk to you about this clinical trial for vets. Um, this webinar is recorded, so if you want to access it later, you will be receiving a webinar recording um, in the near future after this webinar, and it'll go on our social media when it's ready as well. So expect that in the next few days or so. And just some housekeeping. You all are on mute, those are who are joining us. Um, you are attendees, so we can't see you. We can only see you in the chat or the Q&A. If you have a question, there will be time for questions at the end. I think there will be plenty of time for questions at the end. So if you have any questions during or any that you think of at the end, we have a dedicated Q&A section with a dedicated Q&A box. So be sure to find that Q&A box and put your question in there. I'll try to look at questions in the chat, but really I look at the Q&A box for questions. So try to keep questions out of the chat box and in the Q&A box. And I think with that, I, that's all of our housekeeping. So I'm going to hand this over to Kim Therrelson. She's the Executive Director of Patient Advocacy at ACER Therapeutics. Thank you so much, Katie. So in order for me to share, you need to stop share. There we go. Let me get my slides up. Hang on one second. All right. Okay, how are we looking? Perfect. Okay, great. Well, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. Nice to see familiar faces in the participant list. It's always great to get back together with the VADS community. I know many of you have met me before, but for those of you who haven't, I'm Kim Tharlson. I am the Executive Director of Patient Advocacy and Engagement at ACER Therapeutics. Um, ACER has been around for, actually just had my five-year anniversary, so a little bit longer than that because I joined the organization um, shortly after they became public back in 2017. As many of you know, we uh, were working towards commercializing a product called Itsevo, which is Silipril years ago for um, the treatment of VADs, and the FDA asked that we do some additional studies. So here we are bringing the clinical trial to the community, hoping that we can foster the data that's necessary to say that Silipril is effective um, and therefore bring a treatment option to this community for the first time. So what we're going to do here today is talk about the trial and um, how it's designed, as well as who would be eligible to participate, um, and then give you an opportunity to ask questions so you better understand, you know, what it would take to be potentially enrolled in the study, or if you were, you know, considering even attempting to. So very open and honest discussion tonight. Just feel free to ask any questions if there's anything that's unclear or if there's things that are just you know, squirreling in your mind that you want to know about, even if it has to do with comparisons to the A2 study, which unfortunately we know is not on the table right now. We're here to help answer anything and everything that we can. So with that, um, the folks that you'll have uh, to pick brains on tonight, although there are a number of ESER personnel who are listening in in the background, um, you've got our Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Adrian Quartel. He's uh, with ACER Therapeutics. He's also a cardiologist by training. Um, correct me if I'm wrong on that, Adrian. If it's not cardiology, it's cardiovascular surgeon, one of the two, but definitely in the, the cardiac one. world. <laughs> what was that? The latter. The latter. Okay. Um, as well as Dr. Ian Harris, who is cardiologist medical director at um, an adult congenital heart disease program at University of California, San Francisco, and also treats a number of vets patients in his practice as well as was uh, he was a key member on the team that helped us to develop the protocol for this clinical study. So he's definitely a resource that we would love for you to tap into if you have questions uh, tonight about how the study would um, play into your existing relationships with your physicians, or you know, even if it's just the perspective from the medical community, we've got Dr. Harris here to lend us that perspective if you have questions. And then of course there's me. <laughs> So we're gonna start by talking about what this study is and how the trial is designed. It is very unique from traditional clinical trials that you may or may not be aware of and how things work in the drug development world. Um, this is sort of a new approach to doing clinical studies and it's becoming more and more um, popular, especially since the world of COVID has introduced 
us all to telemedicine and doing things virtually and finding ways to get on with your life without having to leave your house. And that is essentially what this study is designed to do, alleviate that need for you to venture far away from home to participate in the study. So that is why it's called decentralized. Decentralized means that there's not one, two or three specific physicians or offices that are um, in charge of running the study where you would have to potentially travel to go check in and get you know checkups while you're in the study. Everything in the study happens for the most part with the exception of some studies that you'll have to get done at your local hospital or with your own physician will happen either at your home or with the use of telemedicine. So the study is designed to be a phase three randomized, which means you know that we won't know who's on drug and who's not, double blind, uh, placebo controlled. So some folks in the study will be given drug, active drug, and some folks will be given a placebo um, to evaluate the efficacy of soliprolol. And that is um, a product that is currently being used outside of the US for the treatment of VADs um, in many other countries, just not approved yet here in the US, and which is, which is the goal at the end of the study. So in the decentralized uh, nature of this program, it means that all your study visits are gonna be conducted by a registered nurse, that nurse or other healthcare provider that will be coming to your home. And if they can't come to your home, then they'll hook up with you on telemedicine and you'll check in, talk about any um, symptoms or anything you're experiencing while you're in the study, just give your uh, regular monthly updates. All of it will be done at the convenience of either in your home or via telemedicine. You'll be provided instructions for how to take the drug and you won't have to go to your pharmacy to pick it up. It's all gonna be shipped to your house if you're enrolled in the study. So no worries about trying to find your way to a CVS, Walgreens, any of that. Everything comes directly to your home from the company that's managing the study, which is Science 37. I'll talk more about that in a second. Um, and then you'll also be able to continue with your regularly scheduled visits with your primary care doctor, whichever doctor's managing your beds or any of your other um, health care. We're not asking you to switch providers. We expect that you continue on with your normal routine and how often you would visit your doctor if you weren't enrolled in the study. So we're really working to try to minimize the inconvenience for you if you are a participant in the study as best we can by bringing all the care to you versus you having to go to the care for the study. As I had mentioned, the study is randomized two to one. And that is randomization being, we don't know who's on drug and who's not. But one of the nice things about this study is that for every two patients that get put on active drug, only one is gonna get placebo. So when we're fully enrolled in the study, there'll be more patients taking active drug and being evaluated than there will be patients getting a placebo, which as we know is like a sugar pill or the non-active drug. So you have a higher chance of getting active drug in this study than you would have in most studies, which are one-to-one -one randomization, they would call it, where for every one on drug, one is on placebo. In our study, it's two on drug, one on placebo. So that's nice if you're concerned about the chances of you not being on a drug that could you know, continue to manage your beds while you're in the study. If you are enrolled, we're planning on the study to last for 40 months. So there'll be check-ins monthly um, and you'll be, engaged in the study, you can plan for up to almost four years in the study if you're, if, if you're enrolled. Um, and as I mentioned before, there's a company that we're working with called Science 37. And if any of you have visited their sort of the home, home or hub for the clinical trial and signing up to see if you're eligible, Science 37 is a company that's managing the decentralized components of the study. So there is going to be the folks that engage with you. If you sign up to you know, check your eligibility, they'll contact you. They're the ones deploying any healthcare providers to your house. They're the ones you know, overseeing all the activity during the study um, and its remote nature. So don't be alarmed if you see Science 37 and not ACE or Therapeutics. They're actually just the clinical um, clinical trial um, company managing the trial for us. Um, um, Adrian, do you want to go over criteria? You want me to keep going on this one? <laughs> well, I'll take this one. Thank you, okay. Kim. And, uh, and to repeat what Kim said, welcome everyone. And thank you for taking the time to, uh, to listen to the presentation on the trial and the ability to, to ask any questions. Um, obviously, for any clinical trial, we won't just accept everyone uh, to be in the trial. So there are specific inclusion and exclusion criteria. Um, a few of them are, are listed out here, uh, and I will go through them. Um, for a wide variety of reasons, we want everyone to be um, equal or 15 years, equal to 15 years or older. Um, 
the patients that are younger than 18, we probably will ask assent from uh, a guardian or a parent to be signed. Uh, but for uh, the progression of the disease, uh, where most of the events do occur after the age of 15, we do want patients to be at least 15 years of age at enrollment. Uh, before enrollment, before you actually get those, we will obtain uh, an MRI or an MRA, a magnetic resonance uh, angiogram image, uh, to make sure that once an event occurs, that we have some background information to compare it to. Um, so that is part of the inclusion criteria. The actual image itself is not an inclusion criteria, but we have to take at least a magnetic uh, resonance uh, angiogram. Uh, during the screening, you will also have a genetic test to confirm the presence of cold 3 a one uh, mutation. Um, if the test is uh, negative um, and you're convinced that you are positive, we are in some cases doing a retesting. Uh, this is a test that initially we wanted patients to do at home. And as, as you're aware, we have started to study. And it turns out that it's actually not that easy to take that, that swab inside your cheek and send it in. So uh, we are aware that that sometimes goes wrong. So we will do a retest in case it comes back uh, as not, um, you know, not that we can't uh, make uh, the correct uh, assertion that you have to call it 3A1 mutation. So we we'll do it, but most of the patients will, will actually um, you know, be tested on the first time around. One of the things that turns out to be uh, not the easiest step to take for uh, quite a few patients is that you need to continue the use of beta blockers. Um, as Kim said, there is a two to one randomization. So there is actually a chance that you end up on placebo. Um, there are patients that are on Celebrol, they will, they will have to stop that. There are also patients that are on other uh, beta blockers specifically for vets. Uh, Carvedilol is sometimes prescribed uh, it is required that you need to stop uh, the medication and uh, wash out of that medication before you can be enrolled. And if you're unwilling to do so or unable to do so, um, you cannot be enrolled in the study. Once you are uh, at the point where that is a, a requirement, uh, it is obviously important to consult with your prescribing physician, so the physician who has prescribed the beta blocker, to make sure that there is a little bit of follow up in the cessation of the use of the beta blocker once you decide to continue and um, discontinue the beta blocker. Um, as part of the enrollment, uh, it is important not to have had a, uh, what we would call a qualifying event within the last six months. So no arterial rupture, no dissection, no uterine rupture or an intestinal rupture within six months prior to enrollment. Uh, and obviously must be willing to complete all study procedures. There's not a lot of study procedures to, to follow really. Um, as Kim said, uh, you will have a home visit um, either directly at your home or telemedicine on a monthly basis to follow up with you. The, the way we capture the events is basically just by interviewing you, because if you have an event, you do end up at an emergency room or at a hospital at some point, and we will request the medical records to make that, uh, make that assessment. Um, Otherwise, following uh, the rules of the study is taking your medication and just let us know if anything um, you know, goes wrong with your, with your overall health so we can capture that information uh, accurately. Once we are capturing the events, there's actually an adjudication committee that looks at those events. So there's an independent adjudication committee, committee that will assess any adverse event or serious adverse event that may potentially meet the criteria of a primary vets related clinical event. Uh, it's a mouthful. So what we're really trying to ascertain here is if you are on slip roll, is the likelihood of getting an event or the time to an event um, you know, less than it is than if you are not taking the drug? And the event needs to be qualified as, you know, is this event really an event that is VETS related or not? So uh, we have an independent adjudication committee that looks at that. And the events are defined as a fatal or non-fatal cardiac or arterial event, including the section or a rupture, a uterine rupture, an intestinal rupture, or, and or an unexplained sudden death. Now, this sounds uh, obviously um, you know, not very nice to look at, at these adverse events. Unfortunately, um, you know, in the vets community, I think we're all aware that, that these unfortunately are the things that happen. And we hope to hold the trial as quickly as possible to get everybody on treatment as soon as possible. The Independent Adjudication Committee uh, will 
me, okay. We'll uh, look at the data in a blinded fashion. So they will just look at the data and make an assessment whether this is a qualifying event. Uh, they will do this fully independently. So we as a company are not part of this, uh, this committee. We obviously have um, um, put this committee together, but they totally individually and outside ACE will make those uh, determinations. And these are actually you know, uh, physicians that treat vets patients. Uh, these independent adjudication committee members are also not part of the study itself. So they're not involved in the, in the conduct of the study. Now, once these events have been uh, looked at, we have a data monitoring committee that actually looks at that data on, a, on a, every six months, just to make sure uh, that there is you know, a, a good assessment of the safety of the study. This is an important part because as said, the study is gonna last 40 months, but the actual end point of the study is not known because we're actually counting the number of events. Uh, so we have agreed with the FDA that we were trying to run the study as quickly as possible to make sure that, that you know, Celebrol is available, is made available to patients as quickly as possible, assuming that we will get an approval. So with the FDA, we agree that at 46 events, we will look at the data and if it is a statistically significant and clinically important difference between the event rate, between the active drug and placebo, we can halt the study. We base our data on studies that have been performed uh, elsewhere. So that's the obviously the famous BBEST study that was performed in Europe. Um, and also uh, an, an extensive analysis that was performed in Sweden, uh, a large cohort from the Stockholm uh, University. Based on that, we think that 46 events to get there with 150 patients will take us about 40 months. That's where the 40 months comes from. However, if at an interim point, and the point that we have agreed to with the FDA at 28 patients or the 28 events, we can have a, a quick look at the data and see if there is a statistically significant difference at that point. If, that, if we meet those criteria at 28 events, which probably happens around 18 to 24 months, we also would be allowed to stop. If at 28 events, that difference is not yet, yet established, we will continue to, to the 46 events. Based on the BBEST study data, we are of the opinion that it most likely will happen at 28 events, but if it's a clinical trial, we haven't really run the study yet, so we will see in time where we are. The DMC in this uh, part is important because the DMC is the only group that is allowed to look at the data unblinded. So to be completely unbiased as to whether it's a drug or not a drug, they will know. So they will actually make the determination to hold the study either because um, there is clear efficacy or there is no efficacy at all. If after a certain point in time, they see that there are more patients that have events on, on active drug than on placebo, they may make the determination that it's unsafe to continue. We are obviously based on all the information that we have and, and the extensive data that is available in patients that are using Sliberal of the opinion that we will show a benefit and the DMC or the data monitoring committee will make that assessment. They can also uh, make changes to the trial if they feel that there are certain things that they would like to uh, capture, ad additional data points that they would like to look at, or additional inclusion exclusion criteria that they want to include. They can make that determination as well, or they can just decide that the trial can continue without modification. Kim, I think after that, I'm handing it back to you. You're mute. Um, thank you. So yes, this is just a snapshot for y'all to see where we are as far as recruitment for the study thus far. Um, as many of you know, we started to, uh, we launched the trial or we started the trial last summer and um, we've, you know, done quite a few efforts to start trying to raise awareness for the study and recruit. And I will say that we have found that the decentralized nature of the studies presented us with a longer timeline than I think we had anticipated for actually getting people from the time that they sign up to actual enrollment once they've met eligibility criteria and all of that. Um, there's a number of steps that take place. And if you can imagine the time it would take to schedule home visits and get medical records transferred, I mean, it's taking quite a bit of time. So as of today, um, we actually have 10 patients that are 
actively participating in the study, that's this number here, um, and getting either placebo or active drug. And again, because it's blinded, we don't know. Um, and then we've got eight patients that are on their second month visit of those 10. So we had 91 sign up from the beginning, which you see over here. And then as we go through this, this process of screening eligibility, um, seeing if the medical records are there, we've gotten ourselves now to a point where we have 10. So we're very, very anxious to identify additional folks that are interested in the study and get them into the screening process so that we can meet our goal of having this trial fully enrolled by the end of 2023. So it's quite an aggressive goal, especially seeing the time that it's taking for each person to go through the screening process. But um, we're hopeful that um, folks are interested and excited enough. Tell your friends, tell your family. <laughs> um, we'd love to see, see the recruitment, um, you know, get where we need it to be so that the study remains intact and valid and we can get um, to an answer here sooner or later because the ultimate goal is to have a therapy available for our vets community and the sooner we get the study done the sooner we may be able to make that happen um, so just as a reminder i think i mentioned this earlier we do have a website dedicated to the clinical trial and all things you might want to know from a q a perspective feel free to visit discover soliprolol at any time that is also the place where you would go if you're interested in potentially signing up to be screened. So all the information you would need to do that is on that site. And there's a form that you would fill out. Once you fill out the form on that site, you will be contacted by someone from Science 37. And Science 37 will be the folks that stay engaged with you throughout the duration of the screening and eligibility process, as well as if you are fully enrolled, of course, um, they'll be your main contacts as the study progresses and you are um, actively enrolled. So um, feel free to visit that website. There's a ton of uh, frequently asked questions in there and it is your conduit to getting yourself on the list for screening and enrollment. And then as a reminder, this is an FDA approved clinical trial. You can go on to clinicaltrials.gov and uh, using this link, which I know you can't click on right now, but I can uh, put that in the chat for anybody who's interested in going there so that you can see the details the full details of the study protocol um, and what was approved by FDA for the study. And with that, I'm going to open it up for questions. I'm going to stop sharing. I see we already have one question from uh, Heidi Green, and uh, I'll give her first stab at it. And if the doctor has got some additional insights, um, happy to hear that as well. So the question is whether or not the study uh, is participate is. Is the study for participants who have a diagnosis of cold 3 a one an exclusive pathogenic variant, meaning people who have a VUS or variant of uh, known specificity or mutations and likely not pathogenic will not participate? It's indeed that the cold 3 a one mutation needs to be a pathogenic uh, variant, uh, so VUSs uh, are excluded uh, from participation, and that's one of the reasons why we do the genetic testing. I'm going to have a follow-up question to that. Are likely pathogenic mutations included? Uh, likely pathogenic, uh, yes, they are. Okay, great. Okay, so everybody, if you have questions, go ahead and put them in the Q&A box. I've got a couple here that I have, so I'll just uh, kick it off with some questions of my own and so we get some in the Q&A box for sure. Um, for people in the community that have a null mutation or haploinsufficient mutation, um, will they be allowed to enroll in this study? No. Okay. And somebody just submitted a question, how many people are needed for the study? So we are looking to enroll 150 patients, so 100 patients on drug and 50 patients on placebo. Okay, thank you. Um, so I think I have another question. When you were talking about the eligibility criteria of, in particular, the amount of time since your last, you know, quote unquote, beds event, the arterial dissection or rupture, uterine rupture or bowel perforation, would you also consider somebody who has had like a lung collapse or a hemothorax in the last six months as being ineligible? I'm going to leave that to Ian to uh, to answer. I have my opinion on it, and let's see if we, uh, we agree on that one. Dr. Harris? Um, 
I, so uh, I believe, you know, technically it's, it, it is really uh, an arterial rupture dissection or visceral rupture. Uh, so, you know, uterine hollow organ rupture. Um, uh, and, and I, uh, and I think it is limited to those uh, those complications. Um, uh, Dr. Cortel, do you have a? Yeah, I, I think specifically for inclusion and exclusion criteria to look at you know a repeat event, which is obviously something that that is of concern. Uh, you know, that that uh, an event takes a bit of time to you know become its own event, and you, know, you can have within the same event a repeat, and that doesn't really count as a as a as an event. So you you would bias to study by including those spaces. However, if a patient had a hemothorax that is clearly VETS related within the last six months of um, you know, prior to enrollment, there are specific safety reasons to not include that patient immediately. Um, obviously, it takes quite a bit of time to recover from that. And we would like patients to be in you know, reasonable good health when they, when they are included. So it will probably be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis. If it is a truly uh, clearly vets related to a neurothorax uh, that you had four months to enrollment prior to enrollment, it's unlikely you will be enrolled and you'll probably be asked to wait a little bit longer before you can be enrolled. Okay. Thank you for answering that question. Um, about the placebo, this whole, I, this is the first time I've seen a study that's like a two to one. This is very fascinating to me. So I'm curious, um, as me, Katie, how does this affect like the end result, like the statistical analysis at the end of the study? Like, is it, is that's like the 150 patients that you, was it 150 or 160 that you needed? Is that worked in with that two to one placebo? So there are statistical rules around how to calculate that. The reason why you do a two to one randomization is you truly want to minimize the exposure to placebo, uh, but also not, um, introduce uh, additional time to get to the end point. There are all kinds of statistical methodologies to calculate that out. Um, we were of the opinion that we did not want to um, have patients uh, be exposed to placebo for more than the length of, of half of the BBEST study. The BBEST study was a study that lasted seven years. So we look at 40 months, which is three and a half years. So we have the time of uh, the exposure to placebo in the BBEST study. Um, we also wanted to have a robust data set that you actually can measure a significant difference. Uh, obviously, if you look at the BBEST study, the chances of having an event, unfortunately, once you're on placebo is significantly larger, like up to four times. Uh, since that is such a significant difference between the event rate, it's easier to say, okay, I'll, I'll have a smaller placebo group and a larger uh, active group. But it was really, try to do the study as fast as possible and to expose as, as few patients as possible to placebo, but also to make sure that we will get a, an, an output of the study from a statistical and scientific perspective that gets us the approval that we're looking for. Thank you. And we do have a couple more questions in the Q&A box. So the first question, are, are there any known major side effects for the active drug? So liberal, it's, uh, well, it, it's, it was in, Approved in Europe originally as a beta blocker, um, but it's not a really good beta blocker. And it's actually not really a typical beta blocker. It's more an adrenal receptor uh, modulator. So uh, beta blockers, they work on, on a variety of beta receptors, beta one, beta two, beta three, and they do a variety of things. What you would like a beta blocker to do is two things. You want it to decrease your heart rate first, and then decrease what is known as your maximum cardiac output or your, your peak output. And uh, that lowers the blood pressure a little bit. Soliparol is not very good at doing that. And that's why it's kind of a failed beta blocker that, <laughs> that drugs that are way better in doing that. Uh, having said that, yeah, at the dose that you're going to get it, that you will receive um, soliparol, it has the ability to do that. But it has the ability specifically in patients that have hypertension or have an increased heart rate known as tachycardia, then it actually does work. But all the most of the patients that we're going to enroll are going to be at a normal blood pressure and do not have the tachycardia or the higher heart rate. And in those patients, Slipro actually doesn't do anything in that regard. So it, if you're what's known as normal tensive or have normal blood pressure, 
it doesn't lower it any further. If you have a normal heart rate or you are not tachycardic, it doesn't lower your heart rate any further in most patients, but it is something that we're checking. So one, one part of the study is you're not being dosed at the highest dose immediately. We're going stepwise to 100 milligram, 200 milligram, 400 milligram. So we take steps every, every two weeks, every week, the dose will increase. And if you can't tolerate it, you will go back to the previous dose until you tolerate it and then we'll dose you up. So it'll take a bit of time, um, approximately uh, three to four weeks to get to the optimal dose. Okay. Thank you. And there are a couple more questions that have come in. So let me go ahead and get to those as well. Um, I think two of the questions can be very combined. Um, it's about how patients in Europe are doing on soliprolol um, and what the data on that is, if they're doing, um, if there is data on how patients in Europe on soliprolol are, are doing. Yeah, also there, there are two large studies that have been published. So the first one is the BBEST study, which is the clinical study itself. And then they did a long-term follow-up and they actually followed patients for up to, I think, 15 years. Um, is the, is, is. And they look at two, two things, um, you know, not the most pleasant even things. They look at you know, how many patients survive that are on drug and those that were not on drug and the event rate. And you can see a significant improvement in, in, in the overall event rate. So patients that are on soliprol compared to patients that are not taking soliprol, the event rate is, is significantly lower. And uh, you know, the numbers on the top of my head, and please Dr. Harris, correct me if I'm wrong, it is really a, a four to one to a six to one ratio that you look at. It's six times more likely to have an event over that time period if you are uh, on, not on soliprol versus soliprol. What is more important is that the time to death really changes significantly. So the mortality rate, so the number of patients that they followed over that 15 years that were not on soliprolol versus those that were on soliprolol, the patients that died in that period is significantly higher. And that number, I, I kind of forgot what it was, but it's also in the four times as likely to die over that period uh, of a death-related event for patients that are not on treatment versus that are on treatment. Second large group that was studied uh, was a, stu uh, a study in, in Sweden. Uh, and they followed, I think, 140 patients there uh, for a significant amount of time. But they only looked at patients that were on treatment. And the numbers that come out of that completely match what they found in the, in the French cohort. So there is a lot of data available. The last time that was published is a few years ago. And, and, and uh, to the best of my knowledge, Dr. Boutier in, in, in France is still following uh, these patients. So I'm sure there will be a follow-up uh, report available. Uh, but that data really showed that Slipwell is, is, is really works. Uh, it, it's not a cure. It doesn't help all the events, but there is really a significant improvement in overall chances of getting a, an event. And there is some suggesting some suggestions from that data and that, that still needs to be corroborated. But I know that even if you have an event, if these events are as severe and are as likely to lead to, to death, when you're when you're on slip versus placebo. So that is still data that is uh, outstanding, but there's clear a significant benefit. Is the dose in this study different from the, the BBEST study? No, it's a short answer. So it's 400 milligram. Uh, so, so in the BBEST study, there are a couple of patients that, that did not tolerate it. So to the best of my knowledge, I surprisingly looked at it earlier this week, 64% of patients were on the 400 milligram dose in the BBEST study when the study finished, which means 36 were not. So they were on a slightly lower dose that could be between 300 and 400 milligram. Okay. And for the studies that you mentioned, is there a place for people in our community to go and see those studies? Are they open access or is there? Yes, they are open access. Uh, they're both open access. They are a listed in PubMed. It's, it's a scientific um, web page where all those journals are, are available. Um, I, I think that on the website, I'm looking at Kim now, I think that we published some data on that on one of our websites that has that information. We do. On the Acer corporate site under Adsevo, there is be best data on there because that is what we were leveraging for our initial attempt at getting approval here. We were 
leaning on the European data for um, when we submitted to the FDA the first time around. So you should be able to get it on ACER. And if not, I'm happy to provide those. We have those papers on file with ACER. I'm happy to provide that data to anyone who needs it. Great. How do they, um, how do they ask you for that? Like where did I go to? <laughs> you can email me, um, kaytharaldson at acertx.com or Katie, feel free to share my um, email address. I'm, I'm yeah, okay. come directly to me. That's perfect. Okay. We also have like a medical information feature on our corporate website that if someone wanted to not reveal themselves and they want to be anonymous, they can go on acertx and um, request information through the medical information section of the site. Perfect. Would you mind throwing that link in the chat yeah. box for everybody? Wonderful. I'm going to move on to the next question. Uh, the next uh, question is, can you explain the reasoning behind requiring patients to be off of beta blockers, the washout? Uh, well, so uh, th that is something that we've discussed at length. Um, you know, we want patients to start uh, Basically, from a from a screening perspective and from a from a data perspective, as clean as possible. Everybody needs to start exactly the same, um, and for that we, we do require washout. Um, it is also our opinion that you know, the, the most of the patients will be on a beta blocker for vets. Right? If you're on a beta blocker for um, you know, other cardiological issues. It is my personal opinion that you need to talk to your cardiologist because there are way better drugs than beta blockers than to control the issues that you may have. But uh, Dr. Harris will have, may have another opinion on that. But it, most patients are obviously on, on beta blockers for vets. It works really well. You can argue whether you know drugs like ethanol really are that good. I mean, you really need to look at the right uh, beta blocker. Cardivalol obviously is, is, is quite often um, prescribed. Um, we need you to wash out of those drugs. That will take probably about two to four weeks at the most. We are of the opinion that um, from a cardiac perspective, since it is not primarily prescribed for, for cardiological issues or blood pressure issues, that should be okay and should be reasonably well managed. Uh, from a vet's perspective, uh, these events happen over a Time frame of many, many years, right? So we are running a study, like we said, you know, 40 months, three and a half years to capture, you know, 46 events. Being off study drug for two to three weeks, or being off a beta block for two to three weeks for that purpose, basically is a very limited and very low risk from a vet's perspective. So for, for getting an event, because it's not really the blood pressure that causes the event, it's really the the, the, the collagen sheathing and, and the peak pressure. And there's a lot of things that go into an event happening and it doesn't happen just because you stop the beta blocker. So you have to stop the beta blocker. It has minimum risk from a vet's perspective. We do obviously want you to be controlled when it comes to blood pressure and heart rate. So we do, when you take, take it off, there are tapering regimens. As we said, speak to your prescribing physician as to how to do that most appropriate. That is, we, we are not going to give you advice. Those were, those were prescribed by physicians for a good reason. That is that physicians, um, you know, not just responsibility, but, but you know, he should be involved in making sure that we do that correctly. Uh, Dr. Harris, any, any additional comments on that, specifically on the use of beta blockers for hypertension? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I agree with your comments that I mean, if, if, if hypertension is the indication, there are a lot of other drugs that we would tend to use in preference. Um, uh, you know, as you point out, you know, in normal tense of patients, the hemodynamic effects of soliprolol seem to be fairly minimal. Um, but, you know, as a general rule, we don't use concomitant beta, you know, two agents of that class at the same time. Uh, and then, uh, as you point out, I guess just to be very, very explicit about it, we want to make sure we're not confounding we're, we're eliminating any confounding of uh, an effect from a baseline uh, background blood, uh, beta blocker um, therapy. This just opens so many more questions for me. Sorry. I, um, I'm curious, 
if somebody is joining and is on a beta blocker, but is willing to, that them and their physician agrees that they can get off the beta blocker in order to join this study, are they allowed to be on a different type of blood pressure medication? that is not a beta blocker. So their doctor could put them on like an ARB or something like that instead so they could join the study. Adrian, you're on mute. I was indeed, I apologize to that. Um, yes, they, they can be on other medication. So the only prohibited medication specifically is another beta blocker. If they are on a beta blocker, say a tenolol for hypertension or other cardiology issues, they, they need to get off, but they can, you know, if it's for hypertension, they, I would suggest to put them on an ACE inhibitor or I don't, something else that, that can manage the blood pressure equally well. Thank you. I had never previously thought of that. Um, and something in which you all were talking about just triggered that question for me. I think that does actually answer the next question in the queue, which is, is there a way for someone to be on this study and be on other medications or do they have to be off everything else? What I heard was no, they're just not allowed to be on other beta blockers. That's, that's, that's what correct. I heard. Okay, great. Um, so if you have any other questions, feel free to uh, put them in the chat box. And um, is there anything else that I'm trying to think if there's anything else that I am thinking of, like that I can think of that I would ask if I was in this webinar. <laughs> like, um, okay, I have one. So I have a hypothetical question here. If I was to join the study, and me being a hypothetical person with VEDS, obviously I have VEDS, but in this situation, I'm a hypothetical person and I am going to be in the placebo group and I don't know that and nobody knows that, but hypothetically, like how long, if you were going to be in the placebo group, what is the longest period of time that you would be on that placebo? To the end of study. So until you hit four, until the study hits 46 events, and the data monitoring, monitoring committee has decided to hold the study. Um, so if you're on placebo and you, ha you have an event, you are automatically switched to Silipol. So, or you get the option, you can withdraw from the study and do whatever you want to do, but we give you the option to go into an open label extension study. So you will be on Silipol for the, for the duration of the study and the duration till we file with the FDA on Silicon Valley, uh, but not before that. The only other way to get off is when the study gets halted and there could be at 28 events. And at 28 events, there is a statistically significant and clinically meaningful difference between the placebo and the, uh, the active group. If the data model slides, then that you know, need to hold the study. And I'll give you an old example. Of the 28 events, 25 events are in placebo and three events are in the active uh, group. That is obviously a no-brainer. You will not continue the study and will halt the study because it. it you, why would you put patients uh, at risk of events if it's so clear that being on placebo increases the, the, the chance of having events so much? But those are the only ways that a placebo uh, patient you know, will, will active drugs or having an event or halting of the study. And as said, you know, we think 40 months maximum that we would want to get to the 46 events, but the real stopping criteria is 46 events or 28. Okay, thank you. I've got another question in the queue. Um, and I think this is referring to previous studies on Soliprolol. Did Soliprolol perform better for certain mutations rather than others? Did it accelerate events in any particular group of people with events? That is question and there's an enormous amount of research has been has been done on that and unfortunately in the French study they did not have really good call 3A1 data uh, actually in the BBES study the vast majority of patients uh, in hindsight actually did not have to call 3A1 uh, mutation or, or a significant number of those um, to answer the question specifically there is no mutation where Celebrol would worsen the outcome that that has not been seen. Um, there is uh, not there is not sufficient data available to tease out specific mutation in which Slipperol works better than others. Um, as I said, this is a rare disease. You really need significant number of patients 
and it's significantly like, like hundreds of patients for whom you have the specific mutations mapped out and treat them for a significant amount of time and follow them to be able to make that, uh, that uh, assessment. Doesn't mean that there isn't a, a specific mutation for which it would work better or not. We just don't have that information. Uh, Dr. Harris? Yeah, I, I don't think I can add much to that. That's exactly right. Yeah, it's, a, it's an important question, but. Great, thank you. Um, give, we've got another one. Given your comments about not knowing if it works better with other mutations, can you talk more about the logic behind excluding null variants? Well, so th that has more to do with the haploid insufficiency and in null variants, right? So it, it's, a, it's an autosomal dominant disease. So you could argue that if you have the null variant, would, would the other... Um, would the other gene actually be activated or not? And, and I think there's not sufficient knowledge of the disease or how that works from a genetic level to say, you know, every null mutation therefore makes some sort of, um, you know, collagen type three that is not you know, optimal. We, we, we really don't know that. You know, technically, if you have a null mutation, you don't make call your know, collagen three. If you do make it, you know, what 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 are you specifically looking at? So we have no real um, data to support for haploid insufficiency or for the no mutation that collagen three is really the, the issue here. And there may be other issues available that that call. Um, Dr. Harris. Yeah, I, I agree. I think the, the the questions related to haploinsufficiency and 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 you know uh, uh, true collagen production, I think, uh, end up potentially muddying the results, right? Uh, uh, so yeah. Well, I, and I think you bring up a good point there, Dr. So it's it's not. That it's not going to work at all. It is what we're trying to achieve here is for Celebrol to be available on the US market to all patients that have a cold 3 one mutation. To do that, we need to fulfill the minimum requirements that the FDA puts in front of us. And these are you know, scientifically valid requirements. So one is, you know, it needs to be safe. There's a safety assessment. <coughs> To assess the benefit risk ratio of the drug. And then you look at, okay, so how do I show that the drug works, right? So I put patients, a group of patients not on drug and the patients on drug, and then you, you look at the difference. And you want to be that as fast as possible and as clean as possible. Or, uh, you know, the, the, the broader you are, you make the inclusion criteria where patients that are, you know, have some level of cold 3 and one mutation, but it may or may not really be uh, the cause of their vets. You can include them, but then you know, what if that is specifically the group that does not respond or responds really late? It just makes a study to run longer and longer. So pure pathogenic variants of cold 3 and one where we know that these variants cause all these specific you know, qualifying events that we're looking at. Those are the patients you want to include. Now, once the study is over and we have an approval, what, what every pharmaceutical company does, and, and, and it's not just pharmaceutical company, but, but academic center, we say, okay, now we have the drug. Can we now specifically look at subtypes of fats and, and subtypes of collateral mutations to make sure that maybe it works there as well? And that would be the next step. And it's the same with the age requirements. Well, why don't we include patients that are eight years of age? Well, it's unlikely they have an event, but it, you know, who knows? We will obviously do additional pediatric studies. It may very well be preventative in the long run, but those are different studies to run, different questions to answer. The first step is for pathogenic variants, can we show that slip roll works, get the approval, get slip roll, make slip roll available to patients in the US, and then we will go to the additional subpopulations to make sure that it's really available to everyone. And we learn and, and understand better how the drug actually works and what the impact on the disease is. Thank you so much for that in-depth answer. 
I really appreciate the way that you explained that. There's another question, um, and this is a little long, but I'm going to read it all. If someone on the placebo has an event and you switch them to the drug immediately, won't that eventually potentially shrink your placebo group over time, given that it's only 50 people in the placebo group to start, and then make it more challenging to determine efficacy? Or is that why there's a stop at 28? Otherwise, it's almost guaranteeing the placebo has events after that point. It's, it's a good question. Um, so what we're trying to do is to measure the, the event. So when the event happens, you, are, you can't have two events. We're not interested in two events. It actually wouldn't count. Only your first event counts. Once you have an event, you're basically taken out of the study and put in a, in a different study, known as an open label extension study. So even if you are on Soliparol and you have an event, you're taken out of the study and put in the open label extension study. It, so it doesn't make a difference uh, if we take the placebo patient out. It actually you know, is, is a good thing that we take the, that, that patient out because we, you know, we wouldn't want him to count as having an event in the soliparol arm either. That, that wouldn't help. So the patient that is on placebo gets an event that counts. Then that one patient is counted as, as having an event. Thank you. Will the study plan to include the pediatric population down the line? And also, I'm glad that Dr. Josephine Grima is joining us. She's our chief science officer. Um, so hopefully, if she has any questions, I'll let her ask too. But go ahead and answer that one about the pediatric population. So, uh, so at this at this point, we, we don't have a plan for it. But it's definitely something that we would be very interested in, in uh, investigating. Um, I, I think Dr. Harris can probably provide a little bit more information about you know, the logic of, of starting very early and the chances of you know, uh, children under the age of 15 to have an actual uh, qualifying event that is called 3A1 related. So Dr. Harris? Yeah, uh, well, and I should, I should, you know, as a caveat, I'm not a, I'm not a pediatrician or pediatric cardiologist, but yeah, the event rate is going to be lower in that group. Uh, and you'd expect then uh, a smaller uh, relative risk reduction, um, uh, smaller absolute risk reduction, I should say. Um, uh, I, I think it does make sense eventually to to uh, uh, to, to study uh, the long term effects in people treated earlier. I, I do agree with that. Um, but yeah, in terms of just the logic of this study. Uh, um, it made sense to start a bit later. Uh, Katie, I'm, I'm going to go back to that, and, and, and Ian, thank you very much for that, and, and totally okay. agree. It's, it's you know the, the relative risk reduction at, at a younger age is smaller. So, from an ACER perspective, we are obviously interested in, in investigating that, and I think you need to at that point look at the totality of of you know what treatments are available to patients and what other clinical trials are ongoing. And to make sure that you know we're not not making you know, doing a lot of research, right? It may not be the most effective. Uh, treatment. Other treatments are, are also uh, being made available. We know that there's a mRNA uh, treatment being being looked at. There are you know, gene therapy uh, ideas out there. There are other treatment modalities that are being looked at on to withdraw more for financial reasons than 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 scientific reasons, but you know. Perhaps they, they might restart. So there are a lot of moving parts that, that come into play. So I can't promise you that we are going to do it, but it would make definite sense that once this drug is approved, that we would uh, investigate uh, a pediatric plan forward. And uh, Joe, do you have any questions to ask? I'm going to pass it yeah. over. Yeah, I had, uh, I had one question uh, about the enrollment period. How long do you want uh, do you have to enroll the 150 patients? Um, I know you're looking at 46 events. I mean, if you get to 46 events before you do the 150, uh, is, is that good or that's not, that doesn't qualify with your power calculations? Well, <laughs> hitting the 46 events before we enroll 150 patients, that would not be a good uh, thing. That, that, that would mean that we probably would be enrolling over more than two and a half years. And we, we are really hoping to enroll a lot quicker than that. 
Um, and that's just, just knowing the, the event rate and what we're looking at. So um, the enrollment period, so we started, the, st the study opened in, in July. We had our first patient dosed in November. Uh, so that taught us a lot, and, and Kim alluded to that earlier. It is actually not that easy to get to, to that whole step, and, and you know, it's a decentralized study. So we're all learning while we're, while we're going, and it turns out that you know, requesting those medical records just takes time. Getting those medical records and then reading them and then do the follow-up questions to make sure you have all the data takes time. Uh, scheduling uh, an MRA takes time, and then you have to go there. And so, so that's just... It takes time. So basically, from the the moment that we have a patient who says, "Okay, I'm interested and willing to participate," to patient being dosed, it takes three months. Now we're currently just basically catching up, right? So we have um, what was it, eleven patients that are currently dosed. Um, that was the last tally that, that that I heard of, and there's a group of about ten patients going really to the last through the last steps of being dosed. So we anticipate another ten patients probably to come online within the next two to four weeks online and being dosed. Um, and then we need to find the other 130 patients. Um, as you saw in that graph, for, for every 90 patients we, that, that are showing an interest and are you know, contacting us of, yeah, I'm interested in participating in the trial, we probably are enrolling about you know, 25 to 30 patients, which means that we need to uh, engage, say that those numbers are the numbers as, as they are and that they stay correct, that we would have to engage 400 total to get 150 patients. Um, you know, we, we've done our first 90, so we would need another you know, two. Oh, Adrian, you're coming for a second. Yeah. Okay, so, so I said we, we probably would need about another 360 patients more to show an interest to get to our number. We are currently planning to, to finalize enrollment by the end and meaning dosing by the end of this year. We do also do know that you know, these numbers that I quote, it, it, there is a little bit of you know, uncertainty there. What we saw is that a, a, a good number of patients that you know, uh, participate because they know that they get a free uh, genetic test and uh, they basically were totally unsure about their call 3A1 um, uh, status and they just signed up because they get a free genetic test and we're happy for that to do. And we totally uh, uh, understand that you do that and we encourage everyone to participate in the study. The, the test for us is, is, is a small thing and, and it, if it means that you're possible can enroll and we can help, uh, help you, that is great. But I think that bonus of patients that are trying that probably we've gone through that. So my, my hope is that our uh, conversion rate to patients that have an interest to being those going to, going to go up slightly higher. Mm -hmm. um, we have a significant number of patients that have shown an interest and you know, we're, we're, we're obviously looking at additional um, outreach um, you know, opportunities, be it to the vet community directly, be it to treating physicians, being to you know, specific cardiologists with an interest in vets to see if we can get extra patients lined up. Um, okay. With that in mind, if we enroll by the end of the year, it, 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 you know, 46 events will happen you know, within uh, the 40 months. Uh, if we enroll slower, it will take longer, but for those two to catch up with each other that we have the events before we enroll the study fully is extremely unlikely, mm -hmm. but not impossible, Dr. Kramer. Yeah. Will you extend enrollment for as long as it takes to get to your number? Absolutely. Okay. With, with the caveat that that will be looked at by the data monitoring committee very closely. Okay. Uh, they obviously make sure that we run this study in, the, in, in a way that, that is you know, ethically appropriate and safe for the patients. Great, thank you. I don't see any other questions in the Q&A box. Um, Joe, do you have any other questions that you can think of? No, nope, I don't. Okay, so I think that will um, give everyone kind of like a parting thought maybe, and uh, for everyone from Acer, and then we'll uh, close it. So Kim, I saw you go off mute, so why don't you go first? 
Um, yes, I just want to thank everyone again for joining us tonight to learn more about the study. Um, the power of your knowledge is more important to us than anything, and the more information you have and can spread the word goes farther than anything we can do to recruit on our own. So thank you so much for joining us and asking questions. I want to remind you that I am here as a resource that I did put my email addresses in the chat as well as Acer website. If you want more information on the history of Itsevo, that's there, or Slipperlaw, sorry. Um, but please do not hesitate to reach out to me directly. Uh, Katie and I have an open dialogue too, so she's got all the information I have. Reach out to the Vets Movement. Um, Destiny Lamonte is also one of you guys in the community. She's our community liaison, and um, she's placed traffic hop for us. If there's any questions you feel uncomfortable coming to me directly or Katie about, please feel free to filter them through Destiny and she'll get it to the right person and get an answer for you. But um, apart from that, thank you guys all so much for being here. It's good to see you guys again. I'm hoping to see you all live here in the next conference. When is conference? Oh, it's July. July. Yes. July. Yes. Before you know it, we'll be back together live. So looking forward to that. And thank you, yeah. Katie and Joe and the VEDS movement for your support and partnership on this. Uh, Asa really cherishes our relationship and we're grateful to have you guys to help us get the word out about the study. Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you for being here tonight. I want to pass it to Adrian and then Ian, if you have any final parting thoughts for everybody. No, just uh, thank you for the really insightful questions. It's clearly that, that we are a very you know, well-educated uh, patient group here. And, and um, you know, if there are any other questions you have, uh, I think Kim listed uh, in the chat where to ask us questions. It's medinfo at acetx.com. Um, happy to, uh, to answer any question you have, um, assuming that I can answer them and looking forward for further engagement. So Dr. Harris? Yeah, thank you. I would just say, similarly, I'm, I'm always blown away by the um, sort of level of engagement, the knowledge of the uh, patient community in this um, in this area. So it's a really it's a real pleasure to be involved, and I'm excited to see how this trial goes. Thank you so much. Um, I know that Kim put some um, an email for medical questions into the chat box. I'm also going to be putting a link to our Help and Resource Center in there. So if you have any questions for the VETS movement, for me or for Joe, that would probably be the best place to route them and they'll get routed to, to the right person. Um, so that is the bedsmovement.org slash ask. You can also find that very easily on our website. So if you don't have a chance to copy the link, just remember it's our website slash ask, and that will get to our help and resource center. So with that, I think I'm going to end it for tonight. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, um, Kim and Adrian and Ann for your time tonight and for uh, doing this trial for us. So I really appreciate it. And uh, everybody have a great evening. The recording will be available in the next few days. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you.